The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everybody, welcome to uh, the first of six units in the uh, Lunch and Learn series. Uh, warm welcome because this is unit one, so we're starting out at the beginning and um, in several weeks time we'll have completed the series. So a warm welcome, particularly if this is your first Lunch and Learn series, um, and I suspect looking at the list that's the, that's the majority of you. So let me at the beginning just start out by explaining a little bit about the process and how we'll operate over the next several, several weeks. So we meet obviously, and I, met, I say meet in inverted commas of course virtually, we meet every fortnight or thereabouts at around lunchtime on Friday. And the idea is that uh, if you can't make a session, then don't despair because you'll get at the end of the presentation, you'll get a copy of the slides and you'll also get a copy of the recording. So the whole idea is that uh, you will get uh, those. So I just want you to relax during these sessions and not you don't need to take too many notes or or absorb too much in terms of detail because you'll get those, um, you know, you'll get those as part of the package. Now the other thing is, of course, in between the sessions, you will be given some homework, if I can put it that way, and the homework will be simply to apply some of the things that you've learnt. So I want you to go away in a fortnight and try a few things and, and see how you go. And if it works for you, fantastic. Um, if it doesn't, try something else. But the whole purpose is to try and work with uh, and apply what you've learned, because obviously otherwise it kind of becomes just information and entertainment unless you're actually applying and doing something differently. So I strongly recommend that you do that. And, um, and so that's that. Now, the other thing that I'd, I'd point out to you is that during these broadcasts, you will undoubtedly have some questions that you want to ask me and you can do that. So if you have a look on the right hand side there, if you're unfamiliar with this, uh, this platform, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see a little box that says questions. And what I'd like you to do there is if you can just simply type in any of the, um, the questions that you might have. And when you type those in, I'm the only one that actually sees that. No one else in the broadcast sees your question or comment or observation. And then I'll respond to that the moment I see it. So the whole idea of that is that I will respond immediately during the presentation. So that way we can keep it as interactive as possible. I can't really uh, unmute you because if I do that, we're going to get a lot of background noise and, and it's just not going to work for us. So the very best way to do that, to make this interactive, is to get you to type in your questions or comments. So don't be shy. Um, let's give it a trial run right now. Um, I'm hoping I'm coming across loud and clear and not talking to myself. Could I just ask people just to write, type in the word clear if I'm coming across loud and clear just in that question box, just so that I'm great. Thanks. That's very reassuring, uh, Jetty. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you, uh, Renee. Thank you, John. Okay, look, it sounds like I'm coming across loud and clear. So that's the place. You can make comments in there. You can make observations. You can ask me direct questions, whatever. And that way we don't have this awkward moment at the end when we're sort of waiting for 10 minutes when you're trying to collect your thoughts and work out what you want to ask me. Ask them at the time and I'll respond to them the moment I get the opportunity to do that. All right, so let's move on. And you can see that um, very shortly it'll come up on your screen now. You will see that over on the left hand side you've got the six modules. And I'm just going to briefly run through each of those six for you so that you understand how the process works, how the series operates. Well, obviously today we're going to be talking about characteristics of high performing teams. And uh, I'll give more information about that shortly because that's what the whole session's about. When we meet again in a fortnight, we're going to talk about the four stages of team development. Now, some of you would have been exposed to Bruce Tuckman's work in the past, but essentially it's talking about the different stages that teams go through in their development. And 
The good news is it's 100% predictable that these are the stages of maturity that teams go through. The bad news is, is that you've got to recognise those stages and try to incorporate them in your leadership. And by doing that, of course, you're transitioning the team on to maturity at a greater speed. In Unit 3, we'll look at some tools of leading teams. So we'll talk specifically about leadership from a team perspective in Unit 3. In Unit 4, we'll look at the roles that people play in teams. Now, the reality is that when you get a group of pe people, <coughs> people together, they will, <coughs> whether they realise it or not, be playing certain roles. And what's useful for us, of course, is to recognise what those, those roles are. In Unit 5, we'll look at managing team conflict and negotiation. So you get two people on a desert island, there'll be conflict. So, of course, as a team leader, you'll be faced with this all the time and already do face it. So we're going to give you some tools and resources to be able to deal more effectively with conflict. And if you actually think about it, um, any, any negotiation is actually a conflict in the sense that there wouldn't be a need to negotiate if there were differences of, point of view, different points of view. So we'll look at those two topics in, together. And in Unit 6, we'll look at developing team, a team culture. And what's interesting about teams is they have their own culture, and it's usually a subculture of the organisation. And you as the team leader do, do have a lot of control over what that culture is like, whether it's a productive culture or whether it's a non-productive culture. You can have some say in that, and we, I'm going to give you some very easy to implement tools for being able to create a more productive workplace culture in your team. So that essentially is the program, and so I want you to enjoy it, and uh, I'm always open, of course, to any feedback you have about the sessions or, or otherwise. So let's start, let's start looking at high-performance teams. Now, first thing we're going to do today is look at the eight characteristics of high-performing teams. Now, the eight characteristics of high-performing teams, you might say, why is there eight? Why isn't there six? Why isn't there 10? Well, there may well be more or less even, but I've identified eight from the work that I've done in this area. And I would argue that if you can have all of these eight characteristics operating in your team, it's likely that it can be branded as a high-performing team. So let's work out what the eight are. Let's look at some examples of high-performing teams in the world of sport and have a think about what some of their characteristics are, for example. And then, of course, I really, as I say, it's a very practical program and I want to look at some tools for creating high-performing teams. So some of these tools, of course, are things that you may like to implement between now and the next time we meet. So essentially, they're the three key things that we're going to be looking at today. OK, so let me pause now and give you guys a chance to type in on in the question box there um, your uh, answer to this question. I'd be interested to know what are some examples of high performing teams in the world of sport? Now, give me some examples, type in some uh, examples there on the right-hand side and I will, um, I will deal with them, hopefully, if I know what the teams are. If I don't, I'm probably in a bit of strife. So just type in, what are your examples in the world of sport of high-performing teams? Okay, Rebecca's typed in here the, uh, the All Blacks. I'm not sure um, whether you are a, uh, a New Zealand uh, or not, Rebecca, but uh, I think most of us would accept that the All Blacks, that uh, famous rugby union team with the all black colours in New Zealand, is a high performing team most of the time. And I wonder what sort of characteristics they demonstrate to exhibit that high performance. Jenny talks about Leicester City, okay, a soccer fan by the sound of it. Um, another high-performing team, um, some who don't support Leicester City might argue otherwise. <laughs> we won't get into arguments about that. 
But uh, look, going back to the previous uh, one about which Rebecca mentioned, which is the All Blacks, let's have a think about that. Each of them have got, the All Blacks have got a bit of an ethos, you know, they've sort of got a, like a team, team code, the way they like to operate, and, and they all buy into that code. I read an interesting story not long ago that when the All Blacks are touring or wherever they are, uh, the last thing they do before they go back to their motel room is to tidy up the dressing room. They leave the dressing room spotless and even the coach can be seen on a broom, on the end of a broom. So they, they all pitch in and uh, take pride in leaving the work, the, the, I guess you could say the workplace better off than when they arrived. Um, I probably, you know, being an Australian, I sort of wonder, you know, wonder if the Wallabies could learn something from that example. So um, there's a bit of an esprit de corps there. Uh, there is a very strong uh, vision about what's expected. There's a high winning culture. The players are very committed to each other. They buy into a system and so forth and so on. So there is, and I'm sure that's the same with Leicester City, Jenny. Uh, I'm sure there are examples of that as well. So we can see these examples in the world of sport. The question now is, is it translatable? Can we, can we create some of those characteristics uh, in our own workplace? And I think the answer is yes. And I'm sure, and I'd be interested to know, certainly there's no compulsion to answer this, but I'd be interested to know whether you have worked in a high performing team previously or even now, you would know what that feels like and you would know whether it is a high performing team or not. Uh, it's just one of those things. It's a, probably one of the great highlights of your working life. Equally, if you were working in a low performing team, you'd know that as well. And there's nothing worse and more demoralizing and it can be quite a problem. Jenny says, yes, um, okay, I, I wonder whether that means now or in the past. But uh, it's good to hear that you've had that experience. And if you haven't had that experience, hopefully in your working life, you will have that experience. So what I want to do now is actually have a look at some of those characteristics of high performing teams. In fact, I want to look at eight of those. So this model uh, I took uh, partly from uh, Fields' work. He's a consultant in this area, but I consider that these are the eight characteristics of high performing teams. Now you might certainly be willing to, oh, thanks Jenny, you're saying that you're now working in that team now, which is fantastic. Uh, hopefully you're the leader of that high performing team as well and have something to do with creating that. So when you look at your high performing teams, you could argue that it has these eight characteristics. And I guess the question for you now is, which of these characteristics could you, uh, uh, you know, actively encourage in your teams? Now, you'll notice something interesting about the model. You'll notice that the model is interrelated. So it means, of course, that if one of these characteristics is present, it's likely that it's going to impact positively on another characteristic mm -hmm. and vice versa. If one of these characteristics is not present, it's likely to impact on other things around the wheel. For example, if you look at open, in open communication over on the right hand side. Now, if an organisation doesn't have open communication, people aren't encouraged to speak their mind, then it's probably likely that trust and mutual respect is not going to be particularly present or vice versa, if there isn't a high level of trust and mutual respect, it's likely that that's going to impact on open communication to the extent that there isn't any. So you can see they're all interrelated. Now, the good news for you is this, that if you can work on one of these characteristics, it's not just that you're elevating that characteristic, you will also be impacting on other characteristics around this particular model. So that's the good news. And so the, the key for you as I go through these eight uh, during our session today, I'd like you to have a think about what you might be able to do in order to be able to enact those characteristics in your team. That's critically important. 
Now, don't be overwhelmed. We're not suggesting that you need to do all eight things all at once. That's probably a bit impractical. But chip away. Just work on one area. And by working on one area, you're likely, as I said, to impact on other areas. All right, so let's start looking at this wheel in more detail. So, um, and what I'm going to do is start at the top and work my way around clockwise. So the very first characteristic, and these aren't necessarily in any order of priority, they just, they're all important, but basically one of the characteristics of a high performing team is that they have a sense of purpose. They're very clear about what they're there for and what they need to do. And in order to have a sense of purpose, people need to have some very clear expectations of what they individually and collectively should or shouldn't be doing. Now that, of course, will often come from the leader. The leader will set the tone as to what is acceptable and unacceptable behaviour. And so, but the that sounds very simple, doesn't it? But the problem with that is that expectations are a lot more complex than we might actually imagine. Let me demonstrate to you what I mean. What I'm going to show you now is that there are seven different questions that need to be addressed in order for us to set very clear expectations and to manage those expectations in our workplace. So let's have a look at each of these. And as I'm going through these questions, I'd like you to have a think about how closely aligned you are to each of these. The most fundamental question that you need to be able to answer as a leader of a team is what are your expectations of your team? What are your expectations of yourself? What are your expectations of your team? What are your expectations of the work that people do? Now, obviously, if you can't articulate that clearly in your head, then obviously that's going to be problematic because you, you, you know, if you haven't got it clear in your head, then how can you communicate it? So you need occasionally to sit down and think, what's the minimum acceptable standard of performance that I will tolerate in the team that I'm working with? That can be a very liberating exercise. Get out a pen and a paper and start to ask yourself the question, what do I accept? and what won't I accept in my team? Now you as the leader have the responsibility to come up with this line in the sand because who else is going to come up with it if you don't? You might argue, well surely the team should collectively come up with that. Well, to a point, but I think fundamentally you've got to be the starting point, the catalyst in this regard. Now, how once you've decided what you expect, the next question is, to ask, have I communicated those expectations to my team? Now you might say, well, yeah, I did that. I did that last month, or I did that in the team meeting last week. The reality is you need to be consistent and persistent. In other words, you need to consistently communicate your expectations and you need to be con consistent and you need to be persistent and consistent, consistent as in your expectations are always the same. You can do this one-on-one, -on -one, you can do this in a team environment, but ultimately you've got to be always articulating what the line in the sand is. All right, so that's the, the test, have you communicated? So once I've done that, the next question that comes to mind is, do my team actually understand my expectations? So it's all very well for you to know what your expectations are. It's all very well for you to have actually communicated those consistently and persistently. But the question then arises, do your team member actually understand your expectations? And of course, leaders are notorious for making assumptions that team members actually get the expectations. So, have a think about that. Now, people won't often say to you, oh, look, I don't understand what you're, what you're wanting me to do, or I don't understand what the end result is here. They'll often sort of muddle through and, and they don't do that because they don't want to lose face or they make an assumption that they should know. But that's not the end of it. That's only three questions. Question number four, do your team members accept your expectations 
So one is I have expectations, two is I've communicated them, three is that people understand them, but four is do they accept them? Do they think they're fair and reasonable? So we've often, we've often had a culture, particularly in sales environments, where sales managers will put up a significant um, budget, budgetary uh, you know, revenue targets, knowing full well that they won't be achieved, but thinking in their head that if we can get halfway there, then we're in the right space. But of course, employees or salespeople are up to speed with that. And of course, they get very cynical about the sales targets. And of course, they realise they're not real and they don't accept them. So we want people to accept the expectations. And um, that becomes important because obviously, if people aren't accepting them, they're not going to actually um, achieve them. One thing to accept them, it's another thing to commit to them. And when I say commit, I mean commit consistently. So are your team committed to meeting these expectations? The best way to find out, of course, is to ask people. Ask people in open forums, ask people one on one, are you committed to getting this job done, you know, according to these standards? Just get just put it on people because you have a right to know whether people are committed to the the standards that you have um, you have held the team accountable for, and if of course people aren't committed to them, it's better off knowing that early on than it is later on finding out that there's no commitment to those standards. So you can see this is quite a complex thing, isn't it? It's not just a matter of communicating a set of expectations and everything else just falls into place. It becomes more complex than that. It gets even more complex. So question six then becomes, do my team members know how they're performing against those expectations? Now that's important because if they don't know how they're performing against those expectations, then how can they improve their performance? And so sometimes, of course, people aren't given any feedback by their leaders about how they're performing. So please don't don't let anyone die wondering, let them know how they're performing, both good, bad or indifferent. You need to be communicating with people what your uh, feedback is in relation to people meeting those performance standards. This is done moment by moment, task by task, project by project, day by day, person by person. You need to be doing this on a regular, consistent basis. And the final question, in all of this is, am I supporting my team members in achieving those expectations? Now that's important because um, the reality is, um, you, you are the person in your team who is the most likely to be able to take out barriers, um, remove roadblocks in your organisation, make things easier for people to do. And if you're not doing that, of course, you're, you're not, you're, I guess, abrogating your responsibility as a team leader. So you can see that it's very complex, isn't it? And it's not a simple task. So shared vision uh, or shared purpose, which is the first category, needs to be backed up by some clarity about what is expected in our team. The second characteristic is open communication. So do you, would you, would you suggest for a moment that you have open communication in your team or do you feel that people just don't raise topics or, you know, bring things up in meetings because they are concerned about opening a can of worms? Now, you can have an impact on that. And I think one of the ways to start that is to start having regular conversations with your team. And what I mean by that is that you should be starting to have one-on-one -on -one dialogues with each team member, perhaps once a fortnight or at the very least once every three weeks. And these conversations should be freewheeling, talking about development and how the person is generally going in their work. Now, um, Anyone, any leader that I've spoken to that has implemented a system like that has found this to work really, really well. Uh, it works really well because what you're doing is you're opening up the lines of communication between yourself and your team members. 
All right. Now, I've got a little framework that might assist you with that, and I'm not suggesting you need to use this framework, but this is the five conversations framework that I have applied, come up on your screen shortly by the look of it. This is the five conversations framework. The five conversations framework is a framework that's designed to have five conversations with the people that you lead. One of those conversations occurs each month. So it's not too much of an ask that each month you have a development conversation with each of your team members. So this might be a framework that you use. You don't have to use it. You can use anything you like, but it just adds a little bit of structure if you're interested in structure around how you might do that. So the first month you might talk about climate review, which looks at people's job satisfaction, the morale and the communication. So you might you start that process by saying, how would you rate your current job satisfaction on a scale of one to 10? 10? 10's high, one's low. Interesting question, isn't it? The person may say six. And of course, it doesn't really matter whether they say six, one or nine. The next question is the critically important one. You ask why? So it opens a door for people to talk a little bit about their job and how they're coping and what they're doing and so forth. And then of course, you can move into things like morale and communication. So if you want some more information about the five conversations framework, I'm happy to send you some material on that. There's plenty out there. Uh, this all comes from one of my, my books. And then, then month two, your conversations about strengths and talents. Instead of going straight for the jugular and talking about people's weaknesses, why aren't we starting to talk about what they're good at? You find that you'll get better results because if you work on what people's natural aptitudes are and be looking at ways and means of applying it more so in the context of the teamwork, you'll get much, much better results. Opportunities for growth, of course, is self-explanatory. This is about improving in performance standards. Learning and development, if you have a conversation on strengths and talents and opportunities for growth, it's likely that you'll uh, be able to unearth a number of learning opportunities, which aren't necessarily about sending people off to courses. It may well be about you coaching them or explaining to people how things are done. And the final conversation is an innovation and continuous improvement conversation. How can we make things more efficient and effective in our team? So that's a great framework I'd commend to you. I'm not suggesting you have to use it, but I think it's a good starting point. And guys, if you've got any questions, I might just uh, give you a chance to collect your thoughts. I've thrown a lot at you um, in the first half an hour. If you've got anything that you want to comment on or ask me questions, then please just go to that um, question box and type it in and I, I will see it and respond to it. So that's characteristic number two, which is open information. Characteristic number three is that we have a reasonably high level of trust and mutual respect in our team and between team members. Now we'll never have 100% trust right? There's not 100% trust even in the family environment. So it's probably not likely to happen in a team. But you can cultivate higher levels of trust if you make a serious effort to do some of the other things in the model. But if you've got low levels of trust and mutual disrespect, that creates problems. And it can be very, very difficult to deal with We've just got a question here. Um, so how do you make the conversations honest and not just about feel good items? Well, I think that's a, that's a good question, Jenny. Uh, I think the key thing in those conversations is you need to, um, it's the questions that you ask and that's why we give you the questions if you need. But if you ask somebody, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your current job satisfaction? And they say five, and you say why? And they say, well, you know, I, I just get very frustrated because there are other parts of the organization that don't communicate with us as effectively as they could. Then that opens up a very honest conversation about what can be done about that, if anything. 
So I think it's the nature of the questions you asked, and it's not really just about feel good, it's really about um, opening up a dialogue. See, what actually happens is the opposite. We don't have these conversations because we think that the best thing to do is to not address the elephant in the room. So what we're doing is trying to be nice by not talking about this. So my suggestion is that you actually have these conversations so that people know exactly where they stand. If you look at some of these sporting teams that you mentioned earlier, you will find that high performing sporting teams do have sessions or truth sessions or whatever you want to call it, where the players actually give their feedback and response to a range of matters in the team. So the conversations themselves are very effective that way. All right, so hopefully that, that sort of addressed the, the uh, question, Jenny, for you. So what are the characteristics of trust and mutual respect? Now, trust doesn't mean liking. You know, I can trust somebody but not necessarily like them. I think this is the important thing. Um, but look, I'm not going to run through all of these characteristics that you can see on your screen right now, but essentially if you said to me, what are the ingredients of trust? Well, it's being authentic or sincere. It's being reliable. In other words, walking at the talk, all right? It's making a commitment and following through on that commitment. It's having a degree of integrity and, you know, saying it how it is and doing what you say saying what you mean and doing what you, and however that saying goes, you know what I mean. It's having a level of competence as well can be useful because obviously if people aren't competent, that can reduce trust, trust levels. And then if there's a consistency of behaviour and message in there, we're likely to elevate trust levels. My strong advice for you is to um, probably work on a number of the other things around the wheel, such as the conversations. And if you do that, you're likely to elevate trust in your team somewhat. Uh, if two people just don't get on in your team, then you really need to approach that as a topic. You need to sit down with each of them one-on-one -on -one, and you need to explain to them that it is important for them to work with the other person. This is non-negotiable. Um, and it's not a question of liking people, it's a question of working with people and uh, work with both of them and then get them both together and make sure that they make a commitment to you that they will do everything they can to work effectively together. Easier said than done because lots of people carrying around all sorts of grudges, but, I, but you, as you can well appreciate, this is not going to build a high performing team if you've got two people who just don't see eye to eye and refuse to budge on that issue. The next characteristic around the wheel is shared um, leadership. Now, shared leadership is a philosophy about you varying your leadership style and you vary your leadership st the style depending on the maturity of the team. And what I want to do is give you a, a handle on what that might look like, but also deferring to other people in the team who may have an innate strength or talent around an area that perhaps you don't. So it's about using the collective of the team sometimes to make decisions. Now, don't get me wrong, your team expect you to make tough decisions at certain times and they will want you not to shirk that responsibility. So make those decisions, but at other times where you feel that the collective should be involved in the decision-making process, then you do so. That's a judgment call, I realise, and sometimes um, that comes with experience. But nevertheless, you need to know when to do that. Here's a thing, here's a little model that's well known um, and I'm sure you've seen it before, that might be very helpful for you to make those judgment calls. Of course, this is, this is uh, Blanchard's uh, situational leadership model, and it's a very simple model, and it's a very effective model, and it stood the test of time. Let me just run through it with you. Down the bottom here, we have directive behaviour. Low directive, high directive. This is your behaviour. So if I'm over here, this is me very much being directive. If it's me over here, it's me being very collaborative. Then down here, we have the supportive behaviour. 
So very highly supportive of my people and very low supporting of my people. So they're the two variables. And down here, you'll notice that we have the level of uh, maturity of the team. So let's have a look at these. D4 is you've got a high competence in your team and high commitment. Now, if you've got high competence and high commitment, hallelujah, you've got a fantastic team to work with and, and that's one of the characteristics of a high performing team, undoubtedly. So not everyone's got that, unfortunately. Now over here on D1 is the opposite. This is low competence, in other words, the skill level is very low, and, uh, and, but, but high commitment. So what, what this means is that this team um, is very keen and eager, but they don't have a high skill level. All right, so that was going to require a different sort of leadership, is it not, from here. D3, D3 is you've got a moderate to high competence level, so it's a maybe a new team with some mix of experienced and inexperienced operators, and uh, there's a variable commitment. And then when we get to D2, we've got low to some competence, so not a lot of experience or competence in the team and low commitment. So you've got a situation here that uh, um, is not ideal. So your job, of course, is to try, if possible, to get to a D4 arrangement, but it may not be that easy to do because you may not have a say in who's in your team. There's all sorts of other variables as well. So if you look at the chart here, you've got four options in terms of how you lead. You can delegate. Now, delegation is where you, where is obviously highly directive, but it's low in supportive behaviour. So in other words, you delegate, expect people to get it done. And of course, uh, that will work really well. Now, that's very good when you've got a highly competent people to work with and they're reasonably committed. Supporting is where you've got a low directive and a high supportive. So this is where you may decide to be quite supportive, where you keep your finger on the pulse, you work with and through other people in order to get the job done. Whereas coaching is slightly different. It's a highly directive and high supportive. So this is really um, a very in vogue leadership style, if you like, but not all teams need you to be their coach. So, but having said that, there might be some individuals that do. And then the directive approach is, of course, where you've got low directive and low supportive. So this is where you need to let people know. And this is where it gets very interesting. People often talk about millennials and so forth in the workplace and <clears throat> how they don't like to be directed. Look, the bottom line is most millennials have got a low competence level at least, or not at least, but because they haven't been around for very long. You know, they don't know the ropes, they, don't, they haven't had a lot of experience. Um, even if they're highly committed, they still need to be directed to a certain extent because they don't know what they don't know. And I think sometimes we get confused with that. So that model might be helpful for you. So my suggestion to you is to try to influence or try to vary your, your uh, leadership style, depending on the people that you're dealing with and the situation that you're in. So folks, if you've got any questions, comments, observations, you know what to do over in the question box there. And that while you're doing that, we'll move on. The next characteristic is, the, is effective working procedures. Now, I'll guarantee if I did an audit in your work team, there'd be some working procedures that were no ne nowhere near where they need to be in terms of effectiveness. And some of those things, of course, you may not be able to do much about because they've been imposed upon you from within your organisation. But there are other things that can be looked at and should be looked at, and you as the team leader should be the sponsor for that exercise. So here are some dimensions of innovation and continuous improvement that I'd like you to have a real good think about in your team and get your team engaged and involved in the process of considering these. 
So here are some uh, dimensions. Now I've selected eight. Now I think it pretty much covers most things, but you may be able to think of other areas. Let's have a look at them. They're not necessarily in any order, but it's kind of like a bit of a framework for you to be able to audit your workplace and to be able to determine what's working and what's not working. So questions around improving the quality, usually this is the quality of what you produce or what you service. So are there, are there things open to improving the quality of the service or the goods that you, you provide? So that's a good question. I guess it very much depends on where you are in the organisation, of course. Can you reduce the time it takes to do things? So some things, of course, are time consuming. And of course, the places to look are the things that take up most time. So for example, a very simple example, your team meetings, I'll guarantee they're time consuming. You might argue, well, they have to be because we've got a lot of things to cover. Well, could they be reduced by 15 minutes, 10 minutes? Could you reduce that time? And what would be the impact of doing that? And would that add to your productivity at the same time, make the meetings effective? So you might want to think about that. How can we reduce the amount of time we spend on various items? Because if you can reduce the time on things that aren't necessarily productive directly, you can therefore divert that time to things that are more productive. Reducing costs. So, you know, all organisations, public sector, private sector, not-for-profit, all organisations have a series of costs that need to be managed. The question is, how can you engage your team in reducing the costs associated with the work that people do? I'm not talking about sacking people, of course. I'm really more or less talking about the way things are done and how we might be able to reduce and minimise the number of costs that we have in the business. How could we increase outputs? So what could we do to improve the productivity of the team? You know, are there things that can be done to improve the productivity? Now, the exciting thing about that is that you don't need to improve everyone's productivity by 100%. Just think about this. If you had six people in your team and each of them can improve their output by 10%, you have just, all things being equal, you have just increased your output by 60% as a team, which is significant. So what can you do in that regard? How can you increase safety if you're working in a safety conscious environment, which should be nearly every organisation, all organisations actually, but nevertheless, some are more safety conscious than others uh, because the risks are higher for injury. What can be done to increase safety? What can be done to meet deadlines? So for example, I'm working in a council at the moment and the administration team have to produce the minutes for the councillors before they meet and the councillors meet on the Wednesday. That's their council meeting once a month. And the administrators have been given the challenge of meeting the deadline of getting the agenda to the councillors by Friday. So it gives them Saturday, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday to absorb, read the, the, uh, the agenda. At the moment, they're getting the agenda to them on the Tuesday morning, which only gives councillors, uh, you know, 24 hours to absorb the agenda. Now, the challenge for them is how can they meet their deadlines of getting this in earlier so that councillors have more time to deliberate on some of the decisions that they have to make that affect the local community. How can I enhance interpersonal cooperation between my team and other teams in the organisation? Uh, how are the relationships that you have between your team and other teams? How could they be improved? What needs to occur and what can I do to sponsor that? They're all good questions to ask. How can I streamline my systems and processes so that my systems and processes can be more effective? That becomes really an important question. So what can I do? Um, what, how can I go about that? So 
there are, you can see that you don't need to tackle all these eight things at once. But why not use one of these things and raise it in the team meeting and just perhaps spend 20 minutes tossing around some ideas? Because if you can get your team involved in innovation and continuous improvement, then you are, in fact, meeting that, uh, that characteristic, which is effective systems and processes. And most things that are done in a team is a system or a process. All right, moving right along. The next particular characteristic is building on differences. And what I suggest you do there is start to have a conversation around strengths with each of your team member. There's a, usually a high correlation between people's enjoyment and their strength. So what people actually enjoy in work and what they're good at are often the same things. And you might argue, well, that's why they enjoy it or possibly, but they might also enjoy it because they're good at it too. So it can work both ways. So are you in a position where you could actually sit down now and with a pen and paper, I'm not gonna get you to do this, but could you actually sit down and could you actually identify the strengths of each of your team members? Or would you struggle to come up with a strength of one of your team members and if that's the case, then you're probably not looking close enough because it's there. It's just that you haven't bothered to look at it. So we've just got another question here, which I'll respond to. Um, Justin's asked, how could you modify any of this advice to suit teams who have been working together for 20 to 30 years, fully entrenched in the way they've always done things, which haven't involved any real constructive feedback mechanisms? Yeah, look, it's a good question. Um, I think what I would do there, Justin, is draw a line in the sand and, and, and really just say to teams, I realise that we've been working together for a long time. I'm really keen to draw a line in the sand and I want to do things differently. But I, in order to do that, I need your support. And then perhaps work on one of the things around the wheel that I've suggested to you that might be the low hanging fruit. And then start to work with that and chip away until you get some results. And then once you get some momentum, move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and so forth. You will get a bit of resistance, obviously, because that team has been set in the way they've done things for a long period of time, but you've got to hold the line. And in order for that to occur, you as the team leader have to do the changing first and foremost. So I think I would unashamedly say that I'm really keen uh, to work with you as a team and I'm really keen that I want to make some improvements in certain areas and I'd like to start with X and then just throw down the gauntlet and work with that. That's the way I'd go about it but I wouldn't be using either the 20 to 30 year fact that they've worked together as an excuse not to bother broaching those subjects because I will guarantee to you that you'll get more support than you probably think once you, they can see that you're fair income about it and willing to make those changes. So when we talk about strengths, and I'll spend a bit more time talking about this in, I think it's unit four, the roles people play, look around your team and look at, this is the team management profile, which I use extensively when working with teams. So look around your team and consider um, you know, how you might uh, build on the strengths that people have, which is very, very important. So, um, you know, that might be a really good first thing to do is to say, well, what are, what are each of my individual team members' strengths and how could I actually utilise those more effectively in what I do could be a good way forward. Um, right, mindful of time and we're coming towards the end, but if we... I would also say that a high performing team is a team that's flexible and adaptable. Now, what does that actually mean, being flexible and adaptable? Now, coming back to uh, Justin's comment, good question before, team that's been working together for 20 to 30 years is probably not likely to be terribly flexible and adaptable. In fact, they're probably likely to be the op opposite, predictable and stable. So one of the things that I strongly recommend that you do is to articulate 
the area where you expect your team to be flexible and adaptable. You need to create that space for people because they're not just going to be mind readers and they won't know what that is unless you explain it to them. Let me show you what I mean. Whenever you've got to make a decision as a team, there is essentially three decision points or three choices that you've got. The first choice is to follow a process. All right, so if it's a health and safety issue, um, then clearly there's a process in place and we expect people to follow that process. So that's non-negotiable. We just want people to do what's expected and that's the way the system works. So you get your team together and you talk about you ask them the question, what are some things where we have to follow systems and processes? That's my question. You get them in and you, you know, just get a whiteboard out or whatever works for you and just jot those things down. Now, if there's anything in there that you think doesn't necessarily have to follow a process or a system, then by all means challenge it. All right. So you can challenge those things as well. The second key question or the second category or choice is decisions that can be either follow that either follow a process or where initiative can be displayed. Okay, so um, this is a tricky one because people can either follow a system or show enterprise and show initiative. Now, what often happens, of course, is that people will have a tendency when they're put between a rock and a hard place, these sort of choices. They'll stick to the process when in fact, showing initiative would be a better way forward. For example, if somebody is in procurement and they need to order product in at a certain time and they've been specified to do that on the first day of every month and they do that religiously, that's a process that they should follow. However, if, um, if uh, the procurement officer has wind of a, a new client that has, go, you know, they just, they've got a new customer. This customer is going to buy an awful amount, a, a, an enormous amount of uh, product and it'll be very inconvenient for them if you wait until the end of the month to order. So you go ahead and show initiative. Now that would be a decision that could be made where you could go either way. You could cover your backside by saying, I'm just following normal processes, or you could say, well, I knew that the customer was coming in, I anticipated their need, and I decided to, to, uh, to go ahead and order the product. Decisions where initiative uh, is expected, this is where you want to find people to actually go ahead and do things because they believe that initiative is the important thing. So what I'm suggesting you do as an exercise is you actually demarcate between those three and you look at real life examples and then you talk about those examples as a means of being able to encourage more initiative as such. Okay, so um, let's look at um, the next category. The next category of course is, and the last category is continuous learning. Now continuous learning is, is important in any team. Now, if we go back to the original question that Justin asked about the team that's been around for 20 odd years, there's a reasonable chance that that team is not continuously learning, that they're doing things the same way. So the challenge might be how can we spark a continuous learning culture in a team that's been together for a long period of time? What can we actually do? Well, one of the simplest ways of doing that is to use what the military call an AAR or an after action review. The after action review is predicated on three key questions. So every time a project or something's been done, the question then is asked or three key questions are then asked. So the first question that's asked is this, if I could just put it up here. Um, the first question is, what did you do well or what did we do well? So you, 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 know, you just completed a project and, and you get the team together and you ask them what went well. Now, even if it was an absolute disaster, there's got to be something that went well. The second key question that you ask is what didn't go well? Now, even if it was an absolute winner, there's always something that didn't go as well as it probably could. And you again 
do a little bit of a brainstorming session and ask people to give you that feedback. And the third key question is, what would we do differently next time? And that, of course, is the, is the key question. That's the money question. What would we do differently next time? Now, this is a very simple process. It's, I suppose, a fancy word for a debrief. And by using this process at the end of most, uh, most processes, you can create a continuous improvement culture by just simply doing that. You don't have to formally document it and have forms and things floating around the office. What the key thing here is just to have a conversation with your team members about it. You can do this one-on-one -on -one as well if it's uh, one person involved. What went well? What it, and you know, get them to mention a couple of things. What didn't go well? And if you get a chance to do this again, what will you do differently? Can you see how that works? Very, very powerful and practical and easy to implement. All right, so folks, they, they are the eight characteristics. Um, if you've got any questions, now's the time to type them in because we're getting close to finishing up our, um, our first session. And while you might be thinking about that, I've got some homework for you. And uh, it's not terribly onerous, but it is important. And the homework is simply this. What I would like you to do is to take one of those characteristics, one of those eight characteristics that I've run through today, and I would like you to go ahead and spark an interest and take some action. So in other words, pick one of those eight things, the low hanging fruit, as they say, pick something that you think is implementable. And then I want you to have a crack at it. I want you to try it. I want you to work at it. I want you to try and make some inroads. And then I want you to come back and I, you know, I'm always interested to hear your feedback. So send me an email and just have a go at one of those eight. Now, as I said right at the outset, if you do that well, it's likely that it's going to have a positive impact on some of the other eight. And that's really good news for you. So I want you to have a crack at that. And I want you to start this afternoon, not next Monday. Start thinking about how you'll go about that now. And if you do that, you'll find that you'll get some enormous leverage and be able to build on that for the future. All right, so um, next time we meet, which is a fortnight, we will start to look at the, um, we'll, we, we will start to look at the, uh, the four stages of team development, and I'll run through that with you in detail. Um, until then, I want you to actually start implementing some of these characteristics and making them work for you and then chip away, chip away, build on that, and then start imposing something else in unit two and so forth. So guys, thank you very much. Um, I just checked to see if there's any other questions. Doesn't look like it. Um, okay, you're a quiet bunch. I'm sure as things warm up, we'll get more and more comments and questions. And as I say, I'm always open to feedback via email in between sessions as well. So thanks folks, I've enjoyed our time together today. I hope that uh, you've got something useful out of it. And uh, and and uh, Justin's just asking about recording. Yeah, what, what's going to happen is that you will get a recording and slides, um, probably not this afternoon, but certainly on Monday. So you'll get all that, so be patient. And uh, so you get an email between each session with the slides and the recording so you can go back over and review, which is the idea, part of the deal. So thanks for the question, Justin, and the reminder. So thanks, folks. Um, I enjoyed working with you and good luck in the next fortnight. Thank you and goodbye.